This is Jeff Deist, and you're listening to the Human Action Podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back once again to another installment of the Human Action Podcast. It's a, it's a great weekend. We're so happy to have all of you with us. And if you've been following along, you know that we are working our way through Rothbard's great treatise, Man, Economy, and State. And we are sort of going on a chapter-by-chapter basis. Some shows are more than one chapter. Some are just one. And we're working our way through this dense book and hope, hopefully uh, bringing it to light for you and, and making it interesting and making it so that a lot more of you will read it. And so I'm very pleased this weekend to be joined by my friend, Hunter Hastings, who also runs our Economics for Entrepreneurs platform here at the Mises Institute and conducts his own E4E, Economics for Entrepreneurs podcast. So, Hunter, good morning. Good morning, Jeff. Thank you for bringing me to the Human Action podcast. Yeah, well, I wanted to have you because we're covering Chapter 8, which is all about entrepreneurship and change. And I think that's really right up your alley. It's something you've studied at length something you've thought about at length, read quite a bit about. So for the audience who's listening, chapter seven and eight are a bit of a contrast. Chapter seven is all about factor pricing, and it assumes an evenly rotating economy. Now, that's a construct which Mises used and which Rothbard also uses throughout this book. If you're a little fuzzy on what that means, it basically means a a construct whereby there's no profit and loss. There's a, a degree of certainty in the economy. And if you go back to chapter five on page 321, there's actually a nice little paragraph long exposition by Rothbard of what the ERE would mean. It would be, well, you know, the value scales and technology and the given resources all stay the same. So rates of production of each good remain constant. Prices remain constant. Total population remains constant, supply and demand, et cetera. So we use this construct to aid us in learning about uh, the, the structure of production, which is what this whole entire section of the book, multiple chapters, is about. Uh, and so we derive a, a lot of things from the ERE, but then in chapter eight, we move into an area of uncertainty, and that's really where the entrepreneur comes in. And, and Hunter, what strikes me about this chapter, Rothbard doesn't come out and say it as such, but what strikes me about it is that you know, we really have to draw a huge distinction between profit and loss and interest. They're two very different things. And the idea that capitalists somehow just make a, a rate of profit and that this is all easy for them is absolute bunk. Right. Rothbard points out that we have to think in terms of profit and loss, not just profit, and that the entrepreneur can make a profit. Uh, he points out that that's a profit above the opportunity cost of just parking your money somewhere and taking the the going rate of interest. Um, And the downside of that is entrepreneurial error gets you loss. And uh, as we'll talk about as we get later into the chapter, there can be situations where there are aggregate losses in the economy um, for various reasons, which we'll cover. So the entrepreneur is bearing this uncertainty and loss is a significant possible result as well as profit. And uh, that's why the entrepreneur is is, uh, so brave and so valuable. I'm sure our listeners will understand, of course, that there's such things as accounting profit, which is basically revenues over expenditures. But money profit, the kind of profit that Mises, excuse me, that Rothbard's talking about in this chapter, also sometimes you'll hear the term economic profit, is, as you mentioned, you know, this is a rate of return above the general interest rate they could have gotten by simply parking their money. And I don't know if you remember this, Hunter, but there was a period where people were going through Trump's past business dealings, his casinos in in, uh, Atlantic City and such, and looking at the amount of money which had been bequeathed to him by his father and saying he'd actually be wealthier if he had just done nothing and been in an index fund or something this whole time. I don't know that that's true, but I think that was interesting. Do you you remember hearing this? Well, I do. And I, I can also relate to it from the world of venture capital. When you put together 20 startup companies in a venture capital fund, uh, you have a strong confidence that some of them will go bankrupt. You have uh, a limited amount of confidence that some of them will be, will be uh, home runs and generate significant profits, and there'll be some in the middle. And uh, you don't know at the outset what those are. And you hope that the, the, the profit from that portfolio of uncertainties uh, 
will be greater than the going rate of interest, that you'll get superior returns. But you absolutely don't know it, and it's perfectly possible that you'll get an inferior rate of return. So I'm, I'm very familiar with that principle. Well, one thing I like to tease out of this chapter is there tends to be this socialist or Marxist critique of capitalism that these fat cats have lots of money and capital and they just make money off of it. And so I would draw the reader's attention, Hunter, to this uh, this little aside on page 513 where Rothbard says, well, it's absurd to, um, to think that there's some sort of nat- normal or automatic rate of profit. What, we don't have a rate of loss. Nobody would, would engage in an activity that had a, a set rate of loss. And I think the, the distinction between profits and interest, bo- both in Marxist uh, thought and also in neoclassical or Smithian or Keynesian thought that, you know, that capital generates interest. And, and what we're talking about in this chapter is a very different kind of animal. Yes, and Rothbard talks about the entrepreneur being on the alert for discrepancies. And a discrepancy gives the entrepreneur the opportunity to earn more than the going rate of interest. So the profit will be uh, greater than the, the going rate of interest. As you say, it's a, it's a different animal. It's, it's money profit. And what that means is that the entrepreneur has the foresight to understand that the consumer who is the ultimate determinant here, has a preference which is not currently priced into the market for the factors. And if the entrepreneur can buy those factors and convert them to sales of goods to the consumer, where the marginal value value productivity of those, those factors is greater, the entrepreneur realizes that and makes a profit, but it means that others didn't. And so it's that adjustment of discrepancy, which is the special talent, but also the high risk activity of the entrepreneur. So you're right. It's not just uh, I thought of Thomas Piketty when when reading that remark by Rothbard and Piketty believes that the rich get richer just by (laughs) by uh, inheriting their capital and and taking the five percent on it. And the entrepreneurial role is entirely, entirely different. They're performing the social role of what Rothbard calls adjusting those discrepancies for the benefit of the consumer. It's the consumer who benefits in the end. Well, Mr. Piketty, Mr. Piketty, um, the difference between his book and Rothbard's book is that people have read Rothbard's book. <laughs> I, think, I think a lot of people have Piketty's uh, book on their shelf, but they, don't, they haven't actually read it. Um, but you know, going back to chapter seven, What's interesting here is that time, as always, in the structure of production, a, a vertical ladder, there's always a temporal element, and Rothbard, this weaves its way through several of Rothbard's chapters. And so it's all about time. We have a discount against things for the future, and we have a premium for, in favor of things in the present. And, and so when we think of those two things, a, a twin opposed forces, we come up with this concept of interest. And so... When you speak about the risks that entrepreneurs take, one of those, of course, is that capital, which they have uh, invested or saved or you know applied to a business venture, is the source of factor incomes all along the way in this ladder-like structure. And so the capitalist has accumulated a wages fund. And very, very often, as you know from your own investing experience, Hunter, the, the capitalist is going without an income while the the worker, you know, uh, is being paid along the way. So another sort of defense of capitalism against the exploitative thoughts of Marxists. Right. Rothbard is very careful to point out that the factors he's talking about are land, labor, and time. And there are returns to each of those, and there's income for each of those. Uh, Interestingly, later on in the chapter, he talks about who benefits from the aggregate investment that the the entrepreneur directs um, to the lengthened uh, structure of production, as we'll talk about in a second. And he said, real returns to labor, real income for labor increases, real returns for land increase. And yes, the entrepreneur gets some Uh, additional profit, but that is going to be arbitraged away very quickly as more and more entrepreneurs see what's happening and come into that same area of investment. So uh, those returns are uncertain and they're going to decline. So actually labor and land are the ones who benefit from the entrepreneur's uh, direction of aggregate investment. 
you know, and this idea of interest representing a meeting of time preferences between people who want to borrow money and people who want to save or invest money is so interesting because Rothbard has this phrase where he says the the discount that we apply to some uh, profit or income in the future is basically the rate of interest. And he, he says, or, and I'm quoting him, the social rate of time preference. And I thought that was an interesting turn of phrase because it brings to mind the term social cooperation, which was actually an alternative working title for Mises' is human action. So there's actually an element of social cohesion in interest rates if we, if we allow them to be arrived at in what Rothbard would call the pure rate of interest. Right. The, the uh, production, entrepreneurship, and change that he uses to title this chapter, the ultimate source of change, and he, he repeats this over and over again, is a change in time preference, and especially a change in time preference at the consumer level. So if the consumer wants to consume more, i.e. Their, their time preference is increased, that's going to affect aggregate investments, going to decrease it. If the consumer consumes less, so their time preference is, is, uh, is decreasing, then there's the release of more funds for investment, an increase in capital, and then what, we, what Rothbard calls a progressing economy, one that has, has more capital and therefore profits and, and uh, returns to labor and land are, are increasing. So time preference is always the first change. As you say, it's a social time, time preference. Ultimately, it's the consumer's time preference uh, aggregated up to society. So time preference is always the engine. It's always the first change. It's the one that makes all the other changes occur, including entrepreneurial change. But it also debunks the notion of exploitation. If, if profit and interest both have social benefit, that's a blow against, I think, the beliefs of a lot of our friends on the left. Yeah, there's a super important uh, – paragraph in in this chapter about about profit as the social signal to the entrepreneur that they're rearranging the factors of production they're making their their investments in ways that the consumer and therefore society approves of and he calls it an index an index that the entrepreneur is making the right adjustments and he takes that to the logical next step is that an entrepreneur who makes more profit is therefore being of greater and greater benefit to society. So we should be more uh, congratulatory and more excited. So we should look at Jeff Bezos and say, gosh, isn't that terrific? He's made so much profit that that shows how much benefit he's brought to society, how much he's listened to consumers saying, I have a different preference than is currently uh, provided to me by the marketplace. Please change the structure of production and Bezos does that, and now he's the richest man on the planet. So we have to be celebratory of profit and the entrepreneurs who make profit because that's the signal that society is sending to say thank you to the entrepreneur. Well, Hunter, you know who else is rich is his ex-wife. <laughs> I just read <laughs> I just read the other day, I think she's the second richest woman on the planet or something now with all the gains in Amazon stock. And I as an aside, I would say I'd like him a little more if he burned down the Washington Post, but <laughs> it's his money. Uh, you know, it's interesting. You bring up this idea, and Rothbard uses the terms progressing, stationary, and retrogressing economy. So, you know, a progressing economy has net aggregate profits. A retrogressing economy is one where losses exceed profits. So talk about this conceptually. Why should we be thinking about this on, in, on, in net terms if we're supposed to be focused on the individual entrepreneur? We're, we're uh, libertarians after all. Mm -hmm. Well, Rothbard is, is uh, aggregating or grossing up the individual activities of entrepreneurs, um, but he looks at it from time to time as the economy. And the progressing economy is actually one where, where gross investment is increasing. So we're, we're generating more capital goods, and those capital goods are bringing profits, especially to the entrepreneurs who are engaged in the highest stages of production. They're increasing the real incomes of labor and the real incomes of land at the aggregate level. Now, that's not necessarily true of everybody. So some entrepreneurs are going to take losses. 
but we need that to happen so we can figure out where the best places are to invest. If factors are what Rothbard calls highly specific, then they're not going to be able to change. If, if uh, consumption is decreasing, labor that's involved in the stages of production very close to, to uh, consumption may find that they're subject to decreased demand. If they're nonspecific, they can go get new skills and go start working at the, the higher stages of production. Um, if they don't do that, then they, they can suffer losses. The same with land. Land that's associated with the highest reaches of production is, is going to get increased returns. But if land is highly specific at the lower end of production, then it can get decreased returns. I think of the shopping malls that, uh, mm. that are currently empty because of the coronavirus restrictions. And some investors are thinking about repurposing those into, into some kind of housing. So they're trying to make the shopping malls less specific. But right now, they're suffering. So he's looking at the aggregate of the economy, but also telling us to recognize that in some specific individual instances, there can be loss, entrepreneurial loss or, or specific factor loss. So even in a rising economy, there can be losers and vice versa. Right. <laughs> but Rothbard has some wonderful language about that. He says, uh, he talks about the entrepreneurs who lose, uh, find to their sorrow that they invested in the wrong place. So he introduces a kind of uh, emotional factor. He calls it psychic profit or psychic loss. So there's that. I mean, some entrepreneurs can make error, even in a rising economy. And uh, as, we, as we just said, there are, there are other places where specific factors can, uh, can get lower returns. So the aggregate is to look at the total economy, but that doesn't say that there aren't what he also calls bumbling losers in uh, in some other parts of the economy. So he uh, he recognizes at the individual level that there are both winners and losers. Now, of course, a lot of Austrians would say that in terms of aggregates, GDP is not a very good one or a very accurate one. But nonetheless, we got some GDP uh, numbers for Q2 of the uh, U.S. economy just a couple days ago. And year over year relative to 2019, that the GDP number was down th about 35%, so a little more than a third. So by definition, I mean, when we have a number that big, Hunter, does that mean we're in a retrogressing economy? Um, not necessarily. We probably are. What it means is that there's less consumption going on, and that's, uh, that's the, the biggest cause of uh, reduced GDP. But also there's less production going on. The restaurants are closing and, and we talked about the shopping malls being closed down and so on like that. So we've, we've got both. But interestingly, there's a lot more savings. And if that savings goes into investment and generates more uh, capital, especially in the higher reaches of the, uh, the production structure, then we can quickly convert a retrogressing economy into a progressing economy. And we may already be there. There's, there's a lot of money in private equity funds now. There's a lot of money waiting to be invested. And perhaps it's being invested right now in some uh, new forms of uh, higher structures of production. I, I underlined a phrase from the book where Rothbard uh, conjures up this wonderful picture. He said, when there's less consumption, there's more savings, and those funds are raging, ranging around the economy in search of higher returns. So you get this beautiful picture of these, these saved funds looking all over the economy, looking for the, the higher returns, thinking about the future, thinking, you know, where is the higher DMVP in the future? And so you get this feeling of the engine is whirring. And I think we're, we're at that stage. There might be a little pause because of the government interventions at the moment, but those funds are ranging around the economy looking for places to get higher returns. So that's that's an exciting prospect. Yes. And there's a sense that when government impedes things, capital works its way around in a happy way. Yeah. The entrepreneur is always smarter than the... I remember talking to an investor from South Africa and asking him about all of the restrictions that were placed on on his investment opportunity. And he said, 
we can always move faster than them. We're always smarter. We're, our imagination is better. It doesn't matter what they regulate or what they confiscate. We'll always do better than they do. So, uh, yeah, the entrepreneur is always going to be smarter than, than the, the regulator. Well, one thing that Rothbard points out here is about interest rates in a progressing versus a retrogressing economy. And, of course, the Fed is something that we worry about a lot. A lot of people think Austrians overstate the importance of the Fed. It doesn't really have that much impact on interest rates. I disagree with that view, but there are people out there like John Tamney who writes at Real Clear Markets who says, you know, the Fed isn't really as powerful as you Fed-obsessed Austrians think. Uh, but so put that aside for a second, Hunter, just conceptually, when there's more profit investment savings in a progressing economy, we would expect interest rates to drop, more capital available, less demand. Uh, but it, when we're in a retrogressing economy, we would expect, conversely, interest rates to rise. So sometimes when the economy tanks, especially here in the United States and also in Europe, our central banks go into hyperdrive trying to keep interest rates lower than they might otherwise be. So that seems to me a real problem for the economy and a tough one for entrepreneurs to get around. Yeah, Rothbard hasn't introduced banking or central banking or any of those uh, constraints in yet in chapter eight. Um, so he talks about, as you say, as, as there's more aggregate investment, um, the, the interest rates are going to go down, but then he separates that from the loan market. Mm -hmm. And there he points out that there are tons of interest rates, lots and lots and lots of different interest rates in the loan market, not just the percentage rate, but also the terms that you can get and the durations and, and that kind of thing. And those interest rates are related to the uncertainty of the entrepreneurial project. And so the loan market is smart enough to look at the uncertainty of the project and charge a higher market rate of investment for a more uncertain future and a lower rate of investment for something that they think is, is uh is more certain. And that's what he calls entrepreneurial judgment and, and foresight. And so that's the rate of interest that is relevant to the entrepreneur. Can they get the funds that they need in order to invest in that, that uh, future output uh, that will give them the, the profit that they're seeking? So there's a difference between the, this aggregate and conceptual and theoretical rate of interest, which Rothbard explains to us very carefully, and the loan market, which is what the entrepreneur is actually dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. And of course, we can see that you know, ever since 2008, when the Fed has struggled mightily to keep interest rates low, there are still places like those car lots you see dotted around that aren't a dealership that accept people with really bad credit. And they charge a very high rate of interest, sometimes 20% on the auto loans that they underwrite themselves in many cases. You, uh, also rental centers. There are people uh, of modest means who go into, into rental centers and actually rent computers and TVs and dining room furniture suites and that sort of thing. And oftentimes pay uh, you know, t over 20% for that. So, so the market continues to be the market. Yes. And you know, interestingly, that's all related to to high time preference and the, the return returns in the time market. So you think of the payday loan business, which is another you know 25 or 30 or 35 percent uh, annual rate kind of premium. But that's not the point. The point is that uh, an individual has a high time preference for some money now and uh, is willing to pay whatever the the premium is to have that money now. Same as your your uh, furniture rental example. So. That's really about the consumer and their time preference, and uh, they'll figure out their own value structure for, for that time preference. Is that exploitation? If somebody goes into rent a center and, I don't know, gets an Apple tablet that costs 800 bucks, and they end up spending twice that over time because of interest, I would say no. Yeah, Rothbard is really interesting in that because he talks about all of these uh, internal uh, changes in investment rates and savings rates. But ultimately, he points out the consumer decides. The consumer decides where investment is going to make be made in the economy. Even if you're thinking about Apple deciding to switch to its own chip design instead of uh, Intel's, the consumer is deciding that. The consumer is deciding what kind of, of preferences they want to apply when they're using their their 
iPhone or their tablet or their MacBook Air. So it's the same thing with the rental market and the payday loan market. The the consumer decides. And the you know the the, the great error of the leftists and the Marxists is they they refuse to give the consumer agency. They won't let them make their own decisions. They won't let them act in the way that they they want to act. And Rothbard points out it always comes down to the consumer. Everything in this whole changing economy he's talking about is determined by the consumer. And the consumer is always changing their preferences. They're always looking for new opportunities. The consumer is the ultimate decider. Now, you mentioned earlier, it's not always so immediately apparent whether we're in a progressing or a retrogressing economy. For example, even though we're all very worried about the state of the U.S. economy right now. There is obviously a huge increase in savings going on just because people have uncertainty for the future. And I mentioned in a talk a couple of weeks ago in Birmingham, uh, W. H. Hutt wrote a famous academic paper called "The Yield from Money Held," and there's an article by Hoppe which goes a little bit further into this. It says, "Hey, you know, it's it's completely natural when things are uncertain for people to hold larger cash balances, and in effect." It's not that they're not consuming. It's that they choose to have the psychic uh, comfort, I guess, of more money in the bank and put the potential for more future consumption over some sort of current consumption. So they they prefer the dollars in their bank account to that shiny new Ford F-150 that they might actually want, but they don't want it more than they want the money. So this this idea... um, that plays into something Rothbard addresses, the paradox of savings. You, a lot of our listeners may have heard of the paradox of thrift. So let, let's talk about this. Hunter, there's the idea that, well, when people are saving the, to accumulate capital, they have to forego some consumption. But when we have less present consumption, this lowers demand, and that signals less investment in production. So over time, uh, we need a, an economy based on consumption, and consumption's the driver of the economy. And that's basically an underlying principle of what we might call Keynesianism broadly. And it is completely at odds with what a lot of our listeners know uh, from Say's Law. So let's let's get into this. Let's talk about this because Rothbard takes pains to disabuse us of this paradox of thrift. Yeah, it's, it's a wonderful passage, actually, because he's he's uh, he's quite playful in the way that he he spells it out. So he, he paints this picture where there's less consumption and therefore more savings. And he says, isn't that a disaster? Hmm. You've got less consumption. And so those factors that are involved in production close to consumption are finding that demand is, is, is decreased and they're getting lower returns and lower wages and so on like that. Isn't that a disaster? Well, no, because at the same time, that saving, that decrease in consumption is releasing these funds to go, as he says, to repeat what he said, go ranging around the economy to find higher returns uh, to their investment. And so they find it in the higher reaches of the economy. We start producing with greater productivity. We start increasing wages to people who work in those higher returns. And so when he when he quotes the paradox of savings, he quotes Hayek actually in uh, where he says that the, the phrase originated. And so the, the paradox is focusing on one thing, the lower consumption and the lower production close to consumption, and forgetting or ignoring what's going on in the rest of the economy, which is a very positive growth, the, the higher aggregate investment going into these more efficient, more productive uh, investments, which is going to generate more consumer goods and more consumption down the road. So that's a time factor. It's it's uh, it's it's uh, involved with time preference and time as a factor. So the paradox of savings is actually a failure to see the big picture of what's going on in the economy, as opposed to one element. It's very you know very like Henry Hazlitt. You you got to think beyond the, the first implication and get to the second and the third and the fourth and the fifth, and those are positive. So Rothbard points out Bomberwerk, who had already explained to us that you know spending less on present consumption so you can spend more on future consumption is still spending. It's just a temporal matter. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and then Rothbard gets into this very naughty discussion about, about uh, the length of the 
production processes. So this new investment is always is always uh, extending the length of the the uh, production process. And so he talks about Böhm-Bawerk's roundaboutness. And, you know, that's 18th or 19th century language, which is a little bit difficult for us today. I remember Bon Bavirk's example of uh, you've got a house by the river to get water into your house. You take a bowl and you dip it in the river and you carry it to the house. Then then uh, one day you discover you can lay a pipe and take it straight to your faucet. That's more roundabout. But as Rothbard points out, it's more productive and it's also a more direct way of getting flowing water constantly coming through your faucets into your, into your house. And so um, this, this complex idea of lengthening the structure of production, uh, in theory, it sounds, that sounds like a bad thing. But in, in practice, it's a great thing because you're increasing productivity, more, uh, more consumer goods over time, and therefore a progressing economy. Hunter, you know what came to mind when I was reading this about present consumption versus future? You know, folks on the left like to say, well, these rich capitalists accumulate all this capital and sure they invest it, but they never really spend it, which would stimulate the economy. And then they die and they die with all this money and they leave it to their kids. And then their kids just grow an even bigger pie and that this continues on. And, and actually, I think it was Forbes magazine has done some really interesting work that in a more dynamic economy, which I would consider generally in the 20th and now 21st century, the, the U.S. versus older European economies, um, family fortunes tend to not last beyond about three generations. In other words, at some point, you have some kids or grandkids or great grandkids who just go out and buy Ferraris and uh, you know are profligate and they're spending and are jet setting playboys or something like that. And they blow it because they don't have the work ethic because they didn't need it because they were born into a wealthy family. So the left sees this as a huge problem that we're going to get these uh, uh, accumulations of capital in certain families or something like that. And and it really isn't the case empirically. Right. And Rothbard is, is also really interesting on that because he, he points out that uh, an entrepreneur with great foresight uh, and great judgment will make a, a high return, will get a great income. And some entrepreneurs do it repeatedly because they have that facility, they have that that capability, but there's no guarantee that they will. And he says that the market is no respecter of your history. Just because you mm. did it before doesn't mean you'll be able to do it again. And eventually that entrepreneur is liable to make a mistake and he will be hit with a blow just as hard as the first entrepreneur making a mistake. In fact, he may be hit with a harder blow because in Rothbardian terms, he's now got a thousand ounces to risk and he loses them. Whereas a starting entrepreneur with 50 ounces to risk may, may get a higher return. So there is no guarantee that history. So in this case that you're citing inheritance uh, will, will give you a return in the future. Every investment is uncertain. And history has nothing to do with that. I'm not sure Americans really understand how we don't have any uh, trepidation about nouveau riche here. We don't have any, we don't even have a concept for it. If you come from nothing and you make the money, you can move on into Beverly Hills or the Hamptons and everyone just congratulates you and you're there. I mean, you grew up in England. There's a, you know, a little bit of a difference even today. Yeah, there was a, there was definitely a class society in the um, you know, the Marxist class analysis actually applied in, in the UK when I was growing up. You know, there was an aristocracy, the, historically the landowners and the people who owned in the part of the country where I came from, the coal mines and, and those kinds of things. And uh, if you came from the working class, you were definitely a working class mm -hmm. and that's where you stayed. And you know, maybe you could go to college if you were the next generation and, and maybe get to the middle class. But it was definitely a class society. That definitely does not apply in in the US. We love entrepreneurs. Everybody can be an entrepreneur. And the market is is making it more and more possible uh, for entrepreneurs to get the capital, whatever their own personal situation. So on the E4E podcast uh, a few weeks ago, Dusty Wunderlich, who's a, a fintech, as they call it today, mm -hmm. uh, expert, is pointing out that there are tons of fintech 
apps, which are now rounding up funds to lend to entrepreneurs at what he would say is close to the original rate of interest because there are so many of them and so much competition that access to that capital is universal. Anybody can can get it and anybody can be an entrepreneur and we hope they'll all become rich. So yeah, America is still the place where um, anybody can be an entrepreneur. We hope that everybody will become an entrepreneur. They can get those those high rates of return. And uh, you're right, the nouveau riche is a French expression which won't cross the Atlantic. And just imagine the truly democratizing force of where venture capital and micro lending and that sort of thing are headed. That's democracy. Right, exactly. And that's that's what we on the, the economic side as opposed to the political side of looking at this are excited about, that democratization of entrepreneurship. Let everybody be an entrepreneur. Let them have access to capital. Let them take on these uncertain projects. Let's hope. They, they all win. Let's elevate the, the, uh, the progressive economy, as, as Rothbard calls it, a progressing economy. And that will be the, the future. And we can stop arguing about politics and how you shift resources from one favored group to an unfavored group and let everybody be an entrepreneur. And that will be truly uh, a democratized market, a, a uh, universally distributed entrepreneurial capitalism. Now, in the, the work of people like Peter Klein and Per Bieland, what, one of the big Austrian critiques of other schools of thought is that economics generally, it, it not only does it lack a theory to explain entrepreneurs and entrepreneurial action and the individual risk taker in the economy, but it also seems to lack a coherent theory of the firm when entrepreneurs get together under some sort of business entity umbrella. So talk a little bit more about this because I know it's something you've looked at. Yeah, so to your first point, th there is no role for entrepreneurship in in uh, in classical economics or neoclassical economics. Um, they just have a blob of capital and you know they they figure it's uh, homogeneous because that's the only way they can run their equations because they've mathemat mathematicized economics. So Austrians don't do that. And they recognize from, from Menger's time, really, that entrepreneurs are the, the drivers of change and growth, as we're explaining in this chapter of Rothbard. And so how do entrepreneurs actually implement that process of uh, assembling resources in order to uh, invest and create a production process that will produce a, a future good. And the way that we do that now is a firm. So um, it's a very evolving uh, set of, of uh, thinking about the, the firm right now. So you have the, the Cosian way of thinking about the firm, which is your transaction costs are cheaper inside than, than going out in the marketplace. And so that's why you have a firm. You gather people together so that they can work together and, and build their internal processes so you can, you can get the external production on, onto the market. There are legal reasons in, in um, most countries to, to create a firm for limited liability. But actually now we're finding, and this is, this is a, a superb expression of Austrian capital theory, and, and it, it's talked about in this chapter in Rothbard, that you want your capital to be super flexible because the consumer is always changing. The value of your capital, which reflects the consumer preferences, is always changing. You don't want to be saddled with old capital that you can't change. And Rothbard has a, a long section about that. And so you want your capital to be really, really flexible. And with the advent of the internet and the ability to access uh, global supply chains and to access labor and specialties and download your code from GitHub and so on, you need less and less inside the firm. And in fact, the idea of the firm may disappear. Um, we have an upcoming episode of E4E, which talks about an ecosystem-based strategy as opposed to a firm-based strategy, which is how as an entrepreneur do I best fit into the ecosystem that the consumer is constructing to get their benefits? And I may not need to form a firm. I may just need to form a network to gather all of those resources together uh, 
to bring the consumer what the consumer wants and fit into her or his system. So the idea of the firm in economics is a really uh, dynamic one. And um, I think Rothbard hit on that in this chapter because he talks about the problem of being a firm with existing capital that you can't switch out quickly to the new capital and the new technology. And so what Austrians are doing with Austrian capital theory is saying, well, let's keep looking at that. How flexible can a firm be to the point where, hey, maybe in the future we don't need a firm. We haven't got there yet, but the structure of organization and the, the capital structure of firms is changing rapidly, and Austrian capital theory has a lot to do with that, and it, it originates from Mises and Rothbard. Well, it's interesting to hear you describe this dynamism, because I know you've spent a lot of your career in private equity and looking at companies and looking at investments. So when you see this, when you see the firm sort of falling away to a, a more networked or spider-webbed version of uh, sole proprietors or gig economy or whatever it might be, I'm struck by that because I think our friends on the left view things very differently. They seem to think that the whole world is consolidating into Walmarts and Googles and Amazons, and that we're going to be dominated by these giant companies. And now with the coronavirus shutdowns, the mom and pops are not going to survive, and that's going to make it even worse. Right. One of the beauties of Austrian economics is it's it's about dynamism and it's about complex systems. Uh, one of the aspects of complex systems is you can't model them, you can't predict them. And that's why Rothbard called this chapter Production, Entrepreneurship and Change. And uh, you mentioned Forbes before. They have an interesting article about look at the Fortune 500. Hmm. Look at it 50 years ago, 75 years ago, 25 years ago, 20 years ago, and count the number of firms that were in the Fortune 500 during all of those periods. It's very, very few. I don't have the numbers off the top of my head, but it's in the in the teens, I think. And certainly, you know, we can look at Amazon and we can look at Google and we can look at Facebook and know that they weren't in the Fortune 500 30 years ago. And so change and dynamism is is what's going on in the economy. And Austrian economics understands that. Um, and all of these, these anti-capitalist commentators can't get that into their heads for some reason. And I don't understand why. I mean, it, empirically, we know that, that change is everywhere. Um, but they look just at the current moment and they look at the distribution of, of power or revenue or income or profit or whatever they think it is. And they say, this is the present situation and we don't like it. But they have no concept of dynamism. I, I, I'm at a loss as to why that is. Well, we're about ready to wrap up this conversation. But Hunter, I want to mention, I really like what you brought up uh, just briefly a few minutes ago, which is that we're focusing more and more on economics versus politics. And the idea that we need some sort of ideological shift in this country versus we need actual economics and ownership and entrepreneurship and capital to make changes. Uh, I, I really believe that that's that's the future. I think that that's an important part of the Mises Institute and our mission is to teach people economics and, and, and try to build a society that doesn't surround itself, doesn't, excuse me, doesn't revolve itself as much around Washington, D.C. or wherever your capital happens to be. Uh, so talk about how people can find you and how they can find the E4E podcast, because, it, you know, everybody listening to this is an entrepreneur with respect to maybe their own household budget, with respect to their own career, their job prospects. Maybe you're thinking about starting a side business. Maybe you're thinking about starting a main business. Maybe you're just thinking about having a website or a blog. And in, in every sense, I think, we are not going to have the job security that our grandfathers may have enjoyed at a particular firm or company. And we're going to have to have a lot, if nothing else, a lot of different employers, uh, W-2 employers throughout our careers. And so we all need to be a little bit more nimble. We need to be thinking about this. And I think the, the work you're doing on the E3 platform is going to help people. So talk about it. Adam Smith wrote a book called The Wealth of Nations. And in 2020, I'd like to shift that focus to for everybody, the wealth of you, the wealth of you as an individual, and think about wealth as a uh, a longitudinal concept the rest of your life, and how you're going to build up that wealth, not just in terms of of income, but knowledge and education and and foresight and capability. Think about the wealth of you, and that's a lot of, of what 
Austrian economics can do with its methodological individualism and its concepts of entrepreneurship. So that's the long-term goal. We're trying to help people in an entrepreneurial sense. And the Economics for Entrepreneurs podcast is a start. We're trying to combine the inputs of our Austrian economics professors, some of which you've mentioned, like Dr. Klein, Dr. Bieland, uh, and then every other week, a practitioner who says, here's how I put this uh, into practice in, in real life. So that's our bridge from Austrian theory to applied theory, which is what uh, entrepreneurship in, in real life is. So you can find that on Mises.org slash E4E pod, the letter E, the number four, the letter E, P-O-D. You can also find it on my own website, hunterhastings.com, and pull down the podcast tab. They're all there. Every week, we not only have the recorded conversation, but we have a, a thousand-word summary of what the key takeaways that, that people should have. That's free. And we try to create an Austrian-style visual graphic model of, of what was uh, communicated that day. We're building up an accumulation of those. And uh, as you know, Jeff, we're building a broader platform called Economics for Business, E4B, which will provide much greater resources for entrepreneurs. Uh, uncertainty is a knowledge absence. So we'll try and provide knowledge, which could be courses, it could be papers, it could be articles, it could be tools, it could be lots of things. We'll try to provide mentorship and we'll try to provide a community of entrepreneurs who can ask each other the questions and share experience. So I've come across this problem. Has anybody else come across it? Can you help me? So the community will be there too. And so that's all um, pure economics applied. And uh, like you, I'm trying to envisage a world where there's no politics. We're not arguing over how the pie is divided. Uh, it's all economics. How can I get into a progressing economy? And how can I do that as an individual making entrepreneurial profits because I exercise foresight and I bear the uncertainty and uh, I realize it's nothing is guaranteed, but I'm building the wealth of me as I, I add to experience. And we, Dr. Bailon points out that um, entrepreneurs who keep succeeding tend to become more Austrian. They strip away all of the, uh, the knowledge that's no use to them and they focus on what works and what doesn't. What that is is, is uh, understanding consumer preferences and rearranging factors to, to meet those preferences. So that's the world that we're trying to build. You're trying to build. You're leading us. Thank you very much. And uh, we'll be making a lot of progress. There's a lot of, of, uh, of gross investment and, and capital that we're building. And hopefully we'll be able to distribute that, distribute that to all entrepreneurs through the Economics for Business platform. Well, ladies and gentlemen, you know, one thing you can do to make yourself more successful, to differentiate yourself right here and right now is to read serious books because uh, m much of the population is unwilling to do this. Uh, if you'll recall, Warren Buffett has said that he reads 500 pages a day. Company reports all kinds of things. That's basically what he does all day so that he can make the best decision he can with respect to his investments with the, and reduce uncertainty to the extent he can. So that's what the Human Action Podcast is all about. If you've been listening along, we're going to finish up on the production portion of this book next week. Uh, you can go to Mises.org, type in Man, Economy, and State, and pull up a beautiful HTML version of this book, which you can search and go through chapter by chapter uh, at absolutely no cost. There's also a downloadable uh, PDF and version for your EPUB or your Kindle or that sort of thing. And, of course, you can go to our bookstore and purchase the book either in a beautiful hardcover for, I think, only $20 with the code H-A-P-O-D for Human Action Podcast. And I think only $5 or $10 in paperback using the same code. So it's the kind of book that you might consider owning and keeping on your shelves because it really is one of the, uh, depending on who you want to talk to, four or five really seminal books in the uh, Austrian program. So all that said, Hunter Hastings, I want to thank you so much for your time today. And ladies and gentlemen, have a great weekend. Thank you, Jeff. The Human Action Podcast is available on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Play, and on Mises.org. Subscribe to get new episodes every week and find more content like this on Mises.org.